It's Simon Powers here from Classical Guitar Corner, and this is a little insight into the studio where I work here in New York City. Uh, if you don't know, Classical Guitar Corner is an online school for classical guitar. I and many other teachers who've contributed to the school uh, offer a very comprehensive curriculum of guitar study. But in this little Q&A uh, or discussion about subdivision and legato, I was inspired because I just returned from Australia and I had the opportunity to work with a number of ensemble groups and teach a number of classes or private lessons. And there was a couple of issues that kept popping up. So I thought I might uh, talk about a couple here and that it might benefit a large group of people. So the first one was rhythm. Now this obviously came up a lot in terms of an ensemble group because rhythm is very exposed when you're playing with other people. It's a case where sometimes we think of pitch and rhythm on the same plane of importance but when it comes to ensemble playing if you play a wrong note as in pitch that's fine you just keep going and the mistake is what it is it's not that big a deal but if you go out of time if your rhythm gets muddled or messed up then you get out of sync with the other players so it really can be uh, something that is more important I would say in that particular situation and I think also more dangerously more insidiously if you want to get a bit dramatic about it rhythm uh, affects our solo playing because so much more because we don't we're not aware of uh, when the rhythm when it goes uh, in or out of sync with what we're actually playing so at least in an ensemble setting we can deal with the rhythm because we can hear when we get out of sync but in a in our own solo practice, it can be sometimes be hard to know if the rhythm is correct or not. So I just wanted to show you one tool um, that I like to use for understanding if we're playing the right rhythm, and this is without the metronodal. It's called subdivision. And subdivision is a really powerful tool to break down rhythms, but it's also a powerful tool to make sure you're playing the correct rhythm. It takes it, uh, maybe a complex rhythm, and puts it into small little parcels. So the idea is simply this. Uh, when we even count into a bar, say, as if we're, say we're playing in 4-4, four, four, you go 1, 2, 3, 4. What we're actually doing is breaking down that bar, that measure, into 4 beats. So we're dividing it, subdividing it into 4 beats. So in effect, whenever we count in 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, it's more of a jazz, <laughs> a jazz count in. But whenever we're doing that, we're actually subdividing. So we can take this idea, well, before we get there, let, let me give you an example then of, of what I'm talking about. So even on this very base level, that kind of subdivision can um, help you. So for instance, the opening of Capitia Arabe by Tariq, a lot of people know this piece. And a lot of you, many of you have heard it just like that, right? So, uh, but the problem here is people don't count. <laughs> <laughs> so if you count, if you subdivide, well, it's, you're not really subdividing anything yet, but if you count it out, one, two, three, and suddenly you have a framework that will help your rhythm stay true, stay in time. So where it comes in handy is if you have mixed duration. So let's say we had uh, let's take the opening of Picture Arabe once again. We count in with three, but suddenly we have to go into sixteenth notes or semiquavers if you're if you're down in Australia or in England. Um, so sixteenth notes can often rush or be too, out of time. So one, two, three, suddenly fast. But in order for us to get into that that the correct rhythm straight away, we actually want to subdivide while before we're leading into that section. A one E and a two E and a three E and a... And that's going to help you stay in time. So what I'm doing there is I'm dividing each beat, each quarter note, into four parts, each being a sixteenth note. So I count it one E and a two E and a three E and a. So I'm subdividing each beat uh, and that helps me prepare to play in time when we get those notes. So at least uh, when we're learning the piece, we can have the correct rhythm to stay in time. 
Now, a much more uh, useful situation, well, it's useful, but a much more common situation is let's say we have a dotted rhythm. So the rhythm might be this. It's very easy for those shorter notes or the longer notes to go out of time and maybe sound like triplets. Or, or perhaps be over dotted. You know, there's a lot of distortions of rhythm there, and there's not much in a solo setting if you're playing by yourself to keep you true to the rhythm. So the subdivision, again, can help you. So instead of playing just those notes, you could actually add in the subdivision. I like to do this just as an exercise. Obviously, this wouldn't be written in. So that, what all we're doing is adding in subdivisions, playing the subdivisions. And if we play that once again, We now take away those subdivisions and just play while we're listening in our head to the subdivision. Suddenly we have a much uh, clearer idea of the rhythm. It's uh, clearer because we're passing it out into small little subdivided sections, in this case 16th notes. So for counting 16ths, uh, 1 E and uh, 2 E and uh, is very useful, and for 8th notes or quavers, 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and. So I would just uh, in encourage you to try, if you don't use subdivision at all when you're learning rhythms or in your own pieces, try and see if you can actually count out loud or try and play the subdivisions like that. Uh, and you can even mark them in your score, that will help you as well. Now, if you had any questions about subdivision, you can type them in the comments and let me know. Uh, also, if you want to say hi and if you're watching from anywhere in the world, uh, please do. This is the first time I've done this Facebook Live, so normally I have these sessions with members on the site, but uh, I thought I'd try it out and, and see, see what's going on. So if you want to say hello, please do. <laughs> I'll say hello back. Uh, the second thing I came across when I was teaching down in Australia, with, especially with a lot of the solo pieces, um, was the legato nature. Now, legato on guitar is something we're always striving for. I mean, so legato means connected, whereas staccato means disconnected. So as a, as a example, a very basic example, legato would be where we have the notes as best as we can connect to each other and staccato would be detached. There, there is silence or space between those notes. Now, the thing about playing on the guitar is we can never get a true legato like a singer would or a violinist or a woodwind player. They have a constant stream of sound. Whereas we are always, just by the fact that we're gonna to be touching the strings with our fingers, we're always gonna have uh, a little bit of break in the sound by just touching the string. Hey, Richard. Hi, nice to see you. You're the first ever commenter on a live session. <laughs> Thanks for saying hi. Um, so when we break that sound, you know, it's just the way it is. You, you, it's a part of the instrument. But we're always striving with the guitar to try and connect notes as best we can. Uh, that's going to make it sound singing and strong. So, you know, uh, let me... Well, I mean, I've, I've been working on this. So, for instance, Julio Florida. singing vocal line. You, know, you want to have those notes sing, almost like a violinist or a cellist or a singer is playing those notes. So what's going to really, well there are several things that affect it, but one of the biggest ones is going to be your left hand. And something that I worked on a lot with students in Australia recently was left hand preparation. We often hear about right hand preparation where you um, will put the fingers on the strings in preparation for the notes coming up so it helps stability in the hand and also accuracy with rhythm but in the left hand when i talk about preparation what i'm actually talking about is having the fingers going to where they need to be ahead of time a very easy example of this uh i mean doc d tuning but uh, you can try this if you like A very easy example of this would be, let's say, going from a C major chord to a G major chord. There are a couple of different ways to play a G major chord, but let's take this one as an example, right? 
Now what I saw happening a lot was play the C major chord and then let's say this was a student in the class suddenly waiting to the very last second uh, to jump to the, to the next chord and that creates a break. And what that does is often has a break in the sound because we're more concerned with uh, getting to that note right there and then as opposed to keeping the sound connected. Uh, in this case, what's happening is uh, the, the fourth finger here has to make quite a distance for jump. The, the second and third really just have a short uh, jump across the string, but the fourth finger, the pinky, has to move quite a distance if it's being relaxed over here. So the left hand preparation comes in where you actually want that finger to go towards its destination ahead of time. So if we know that this finger needs to be all the way over here on the first string, third fret, then when we're playing the C chord, we actually want to have it over there in preparation. So when I'm playing the C chord, the fourth finger is right there. This makes a smoother transition between the chords. This is just a very small example of left hand preparation. Um, you may have seen it, I think, in, in, is it in Pumping Nylon? There's some really good exercises, these kind of uh, contrary motion things. The technique itself of left hand preparation uses that kind of facility, the independence of fingers in the left hand. That's why it might be difficult to start off with. But uh, it is really a tool that will make your notes much more connected. You'll actually, if you listen, watch videos of really great players, like for me, David Russell, if you watch his videos, his left hand almost seems like it's out of sync with the video because he's constantly preparing. His fingers are traveling to where they need to go uh, before they need to be there. And this means that it looks effortless uh, and also it means that the sound is very connected. Let me see if I can find another example uh, in Julio Florida just to show you. But while I'm getting the guitar back in tune, feel free. Uh, we're going to have a little Q&A on technique after this. If you have any questions about technique, I see that Mert there, hi, uh, have lessons in March. Oh, okay, great. Um, Nice to, nice to hear from you. So if you have, you want to say hi from wherever you are in the world, please feel free to do so. And then we're also going to have a little Q&A on technique in about three minutes. So if you have any questions about technique, I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, so let me, let me find you another example of left hand preparation here in Julio Florida, or at least the uh, location where it's possible to think about it. tuning as well, I'm fiddling around with it. So here, here's a perfect example, okay? So we've uh, for those for those playing at home, if you happen to know this piece, we're in the end of measure four here. The next, oh wow, Tunisia. Hi, Sahil. Sally, hi. <laughs> uh, okay, so we get to this point. Now, if we weren't uh, preparing, we have to suddenly Take the third finger and go, do that. That's quite a tricky jump, right? Now, what we can do if we know that we have to be here, we can hone in on that one little spot, back up and say, okay, well, before that, all we have is the C sharp on the first finger. So we actually have time and the facility to uh, have the second and the third finger go to where they need to be. So we'd play it like this. And you can see my third finger here, it's not playing, Ugh, it's hard, there's a hard stretch to do, uh, but it's already hovering over where it needs to be. This is left hand preparation and I think for many of you it could make quite a big leap uh, in the quality of your uh, legato technique and also just the quality of your playing. So how do we execute this? Prepare. Here even uh, I have my finger ready to play this. Now what I've seen a lot of people do is they, they have their finger maybe even tucked back or just wherever the finger may be lying, they're not really thinking about it. Always just thinking about the note at the time as opposed to thinking ahead a little bit. If you're th thinking ahead, you can have it ready to go here. 
and then the next note it's quite a distance there again so when we have the option to take that fourth finger off we travel across so tell me uh, in the comments if that makes sense to you this idea of left hand preparation because I think it's something really important and I, I consider it actually well I like to think about it from beginners onwards but I think it's something actually intermediate players work on to push themselves to a more advanced level. Um, so if you do have any questions uh, for Q&A, just anything, if you have any problems with particular uh, techniques like slows or if you, uh, what kind of scales you practice or how you structure your practice session, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions if you have. And there's a few of you watching and probably maybe live uh, Facebook feeds are a bit of a new thing, but feel free to ask the question and I can uh, do my best to answer it. So we already had some people, so, uh, Richard from Nashville and Sally from Tunisia, that's fantastic. <laughs> so watching it, that must be very late uh, at night for you in, uh, in, in Tunisia. But um, what I've been doing recently, I just got back from a trip and I'm back in New York to work on new lessons for uh, uh, for the site. So I've actually been working on Julio Florida. I just recorded an hour and a half course there uh, last night that's going to be coming up on the site soon. And uh, Shamel said the left hand preparation does for sure make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think it's one of those things if, if you don't know about it, then it can suddenly lift your playing quite a bit. What it does really require is um, patience. Uh, it's It requires you to uh, Take the time to stop, look at what's perhaps going wrong. Or if you'd recorded yourself and listened, you say, "Okay, well, it, it could, it's not. There's something wrong there. The notes aren't connecting. We're not really singing." Uh, then uh, that you have to have the discipline to stop or listen to that recording and circle that in the score and go, "Okay, I'm going to work on this now." Um, so Sally said it's it's quarter to one. So yeah, that's, that's, that's up late. Up late and on Facebook. Well, I'm glad you could be here. <laughs> well, I haven't got any questions. I know this is my first live session, and maybe it's the, the first one many of you have seen, but uh, if I don't get any questions, I'll probably just uh, wrap this up pretty soon. This is just a, an, an experiment for the first time. If you, if you liked it, let me know. If you didn't, let me know, uh, because uh, I might do some more of these in the future. I might actually make them a bit more organized. This was surprise. This was a spare of the moment kind of thing. Uh, but what's coming up for the Guitar Corner is um, we're having the live summer school. Live summer school. It's live as in not on the internet. We're having a summer school near Boston uh, in June. We've got Ben Verdery and Goha Vardanian, uh, Dave Belcher, and also guests from Australia coming over. That's really exciting. And uh, also a lot more courses coming out in advanced territory this year on Classical Guitar Corner. So I've got Julio Florida I'm working on, and also Carpeccia Arabe uh, is coming out. And uh, I've been working on Bach Fuse, and so a lot more advanced pieces. I'm, there's a huge amount of material in the membership for beginners now, but uh, we're now looking at intermediate to advanced materials. So, all right, well, we've almost hit 20 minutes, and unless anyone has any particular questions, you can even ask questions to me. <laughs> non no, maybe I shouldn't open that, that box, non-guitar related questions. But uh, thanks for tuning in, thanks for your time, and, um, Oh, it's John! <laughs> Hi, John. J John is a member of the site and he's in Australia. Uh, and, uh, you know, we missed you, John. I, I met some friends of yours, Emmanuel Cray, uh, at the summer school, and we took a picture for you, actually. Hopefully, Emmanuel sent that to you. But we were talking about you and missed you. Uh, and uh, good to see you on here. Well, here's a question. So, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, having the worst time smoothing out my tremolo. I've used the right hand preparation as well as trying to reduce tension. Any advice? Uh, well, Jeremy, the tremolo is... My opinion on tremolo is that it is reflective of a very, very well-rounded, refined technique. I also believe, and maybe this is a little contentious, that tremolo as a technique is suited more to some people than others. I don't mean this as a, a way to say, okay, well, I can't do it, I won't do it. But tremolo, I think, for People, some people have just very fast physiological responses and fast fingers. They also have the, the shape of their hands and nails uh, help them with a smooth uh, process. But I think one thing about tremolo is, well, 
There's many exercises, I and mean, Goha Vardhanyam did an entire course on the site on tremolo, and it's excellent. And I asked her to do it because, you know, I, I, I'm the first to admit her tremolo is fantastic, and my tremolo is nothing to write home about. So I wanted to have someone that's really experienced in the technique. But I do think that um, it is reflective of a very well-balanced hand. So for instance, if, you're, if you haven't really got the right shape, if your A finger or M finger it can be, it will affect that movement. Also, if you have uh, your A finger isn't developed as much as your I and M, that could be the case for many people. That means you're not going to get a smooth transition between those fingers. Um, the, for me, the, the thing that helped the most is thinking of tremolo as an arpeggio. The reason this is helpful is twofold. One, I think it helps us take away this mystique of um, tremolo being something a little bit unattainable, but also it arpeggios are not something that we think of as out of control. Let's see, we've got the, my little suction cup system here is not working. Um, we see tremolo can kind of, for many people, I think, um, ugh, there we go. Tremolo, I think, for many people, can be, it can kind of rush. And you get that kind of gallopy, I wouldn't say ugly, but you know, you, they're not even. But when you think about tremolo as an arpeggio, it makes you think more controlled. So an arpeggio um, would sound, an arpeggio wouldn't sound like this, right? An arpeggio would sound more like this. We have a more controlled idea of it. Uh, so uh, if you think of that in the same way, let's say I'm just doing, let's bring the camera down a little bit. Uh, that arpeggio was just P I M A. So if you, and I've done this in one of my exercises, if you think of tremolo as an arpeggio with that same level of control, immediately it's slower, but you have more control with the notes, and I think it's more effective as opposed to trying to go fast and losing the quality of it. So if we reverse that, obviously the arpeggio would be this. start reducing it back to one string. So people just joining, we're talking about tremolo here, and let's say we took P, A, M, I, and then put A and M on the same string, so the second string. Now we put them all A, M, I on the third string. So suddenly it becomes something that isn't fast and virtuosic, it's now a controlled tremolo, and I think the tremolos that I've often admired, I mean there's some people that have some wonderful tremolos out there, but the ones that I stood out to me, ones that sound like they're very, very much in control. So... You know, so I, I would start there and go through entire pieces to make it... without the aim to make it sound like a virtuosic tremolo, but rather keep it very much in control. Other aspects, you know, as I mentioned, if you're the, the A and M finger, uh, are not refined or you have weaknesses in your hand, you, are, you would do well to round out your hand. So raschiato flicks are going to help with finger dexter uh, strength and speed. Uh, also, perhaps you want to work on AM scales or AMI scales even. That way you've got, you're building out the, uh, the control of the fingers. So that is... Uh, that is some ideas about it. I, for me, the, the exercise I have on the site is this. What I'm doing is basically, I just have a chord progression. It's E major, it's not that special. It's just a chord progression on four strings. But what I'm doing is going P, A, M, A, M, I. So an arpeggio followed by the traditional tremolo pattern, and then in the reverse. And then repeating that pattern. So what it does is it mixes the idea of an arpeggio uh, along with uh, the actual tremolo technique. So you mix that control that you get 
with the, uh, the arpeggio into the tremolo. I think it's an excellent uh, exercise. That was shown to me many, many years ago by Dale Kavanagh, who is an excellent Canadian guitarist who lives in Germany and is part of the Iserlohn Guitar Festival. So I hope that answered or gave you some ideas at least. Um, so John, yes, I, I'm sorry we, you weren't there as well. Um, yeah, awesome. Uh, anyway, it's great, great to hear from you, John. It's been a while. I've, it's been I've been away. I've been overseas. It's good to be back home. Um, so David, David said, um, curious if you had any tips on minimizing squeak along the strings, particularly the bass, uh, when shifting between positions. I heard various schools of thought about aiming to lift then shift, but I find that challenging as fast tempos such as the middle arpeggio section of Vitello Bus Prelude 4. Yeah, just an example. Sure. Um, okay, so squeaking. It's funny you mentioned that because, as I said, I've been working on Julio Florida, and Julio Florida is this piece by Barrios that has a lot of uh, sections where sque uh, string squeaks are pr it's prone to squ string squeaks. Uh, so. <laughs> It's very thick in the left hand, this piece, and there's also um, sections of it that reside in the bass register of the guitar, so like this one. Like this. So I have a couple of things to say about string squeaking. First of all, it's a part of the guitar, and I don't think we should ever try and eliminate it completely. I think that, yes, we should, if, if it's taking your attention away from the piece itself, the music, if it's distracting, yes, then it's at a level where we need to take it out. But uh, um, it's always gonna be there to a certain extent. We just need to minimize it, I think, if it's egregious. So, yes, I, I personally lift a lot, so, uh, Lift up, across, and down. You become proficient at that technique of lifting. You're not going to get any squeak. There's always going to be a little bit of break in the sound. That's the trade-off there. But if you get uh, good at shifting and you have that quick, uh, easy movement, then you'll take out the squeak. So that's, and it sounds like you already know that. Um, so the other two ones that are a little less known, well known, uh, include... Um, Finger pressure, which is one. So, you know, often we want to lift off our pressure when we're trying not to squeak. We're trying, we're kind of almost being tentative. But actually, if you're light on the strings, I don't know if you can hear that, then you actually get more squeak. <laughs> so when I actually have something I know, from, uh, I, it's almost impossible to eliminate the squeak here. Uh, where is it? My def in my, not defense, but I have kind of old strings on right now, so I'm getting away with it now, but um, with new strings, I think you'd hear it. This is, but that, if I was light, you would hear it. So what I actually do, I push, and it minimizes the squeak. If you put more pressure on the, on the string with your left hand, then it minimizes the squeak in your finger. So... Uh, that is one way. It's a bit counterintuitive. Experiment with it. Obviously you don't want to squeeze too much and you want to release the tension, but that is one of them. The other is taking your finger off the callus. So often what makes the most sound is the callus. There's the callus, there's the pad of the finger. The pad of the finger being here, and obviously the callus usually on the tips. So if you come off the callus, if you go onto the pad of your finger, so here, I would actually, I would say this is bad, quote unquote, technique, uh, where I flatten the finger. I would always, this is my, how I would uh, say to people to have their fourth finger. But in this exceptional circumstance, I'm trying to reduce the squeak. So I put more pressure and I flatten the finger. So I'm actually on the pad of the finger. And that way, there's a tiny bit of uh, finger uh, string sound there, but it's not that, right? So going under the pad of the finger, increasing the pressure, lifting is an option, and if all else fails, 
and which it does, because <laughs> everyone has different fingers, you know. Uh, you can also get lightly polished strings. If you've never heard of them, people use them a lot for recording. Uh, so basically, the you know what's causing the streak uh, squeak <clears throat> is the wound steel that um, you know going against your your finger. So if it's lightly polished, there's not so so many ridges in the steel, and therefore you get less squeak. So people use them specifically for recording. The downside of lightly polished strings, and they is they don't they sound a little less brilliant um, than normal strings. And also, if you're like me, a string killer, <laughs> we, we you know kind of not sweat, but you have whatever the, the, the kind of sweat you have is acidic to strings. Um, then you will kill those lightly polished strings very quickly. Um, but it's definitely an option for you. So <clears throat> I hope that helped, uh, David, and thank you for the question. Um, Jeremy, uh, you like the advice? Oh, thank you. Um, and I'm glad because I'm, as I said, I'm not a great tremolo player. And so when people ask me about tremolo, I feel a little bit, um, I mean, I have advice and I have things that other people have told me, but I can't, I have played several tremolo pieces in concert, like the Barrios, Sueño and, and El Ultimo tremolo. But I like those actually, there's a lot of first string tremolo. Recuerdos is tricky because it's all in the second string. But um, anyway, so I feel a bit, sometimes a bit funny about giving advice. It's something I don't consider myself to be excellent at. <laughs> anyway, full disclosure. Um, Alex, hi, Catalonia, wow. So you're in the north of Spain there. Uh, are you in Barcelona by any chance? That's a beautiful place. My, one of the places I used to say when I was younger, if I had to say I want to live one place, it was Girona, which is a city north of Barcelona. Um, thanks for your last week. That was quite useful on the left hand anticipation. One question regards to the left hand. Any advice on reducing the stress and pain when playing pieces, especially with lots of bar chords? Absolutely, yeah. And we might make this the last question, and I appreciate the questions coming in. Just, we're running up to about 30 minutes now. But uh, yes, I, first of all, the biggest tip I can give you about bar chords is the fact that you don't always need them. I think it's so easy to go into an edition, <clears throat> and there's, you know, editions are made by individuals um, that they make their edition to suit themselves. So, you know, they're going to make their decisions sometimes based on, I guess, the audience, if there's a student audience, but usually it's what suits their hands and suits their musical aesthetic. And just because an edition says you need to play a bar eight doesn't actually mean you need it. You absolutely, it's imperative to play it. Perfect example, <clears throat> I keep, <laughs> it's just in my head right now, and I guess it's a good, because well, I've done a lesson on this piece just last night. Julio Florida, at the beginning, people often play this. It makes total sense, I mean, You've got a barre there on the fifth uh, fret holding down two notes. <clears throat> and so often people will just go, okay, that's what you play a barre, that's what I'm being told. But if you just take two seconds to step back and say, well, do I need it? The answer is no. One, two, three. It's freer in the hand because, uh, and you can do vibrato, and you also aren't exerting that stress and pressure we all know too well that bar chord so so my first answer the the stress and pain which you mentioned about bar chords is make sure you see if you can find places where you can take them out because definitely no matter how <clears throat> economic you are with your pressure uh, use of your hands I've played gigs musicals in the past uh, on steel string and so when they're in a key like E flat or whatever, and you, you're not using a capo, you're using bar chords all over the place. And it's an incredible drain on the hand. And it's just the fact that bar chords are draining. And, and um, it's, if there are many of them in quick succession, you either have to be very, very good at managing the pressure on your fingers, or they just there's no way around it. Uh, but basically, there's two things I would say. One is a buzzing exercise. The buzzing exercise I have on the site, so I maybe won't go through it in detail here. If you go on classicalguitarcorner.com in the free lessons, it's called buzzing. You can just find it under left hand technique, I think it's that. Um, and that's just an exercise to train ourselves to, to figure out really how much pressure we need to hold down a note, because it's not as much as we normally think. Um, 
so the idea is that you have a clean note and then you lift the pressure until it starts buzzing. That's the buzz, right? Uh, and if you release too much, you get a dead sound. And so the idea, and you can look in the video, is to play scale or even passages from a piece where you buzz. And the buzz is not, that's not obviously the aim. We're not aiming to buzz. What we're trying to do is manage very accurately the pressure, the weight we're using in the fingers. And um, if you add just a few more ounces of weight, ounces, then we get a clean note. But I guarantee you, you'll find that you're using less pressure than you normally do. Because I think we just tune out, and especially if something's difficult or loud, we unconsciously increase the, uh, the uh, stress and tension in our left hand. <clears throat> so that's one aspect about pressure, and specifically for bares, um, you want to, you don't always need to hold down the strings. Uh, sorry, all the strings. So for instance, uh, you know, this chord here. Think to yourself, what actually is the barre doing? And the barre is only taking care of two notes. This note and this note. The other notes are being held down by the other fingers. So if you only focus pressure on these two points, it requires a lot less effort and you can actually curl the finger a bit. So the, the notes in the middle are actually dead. By letting that job be taken care of by the other fingers. So you can really analyze each situation to try and remove as much pressure as possible. Um, the final thing I'll say, and this is a bit more detailed um, of technique, is that a lot of us, I think, unless we've been taught otherwise, will squeeze in the left hand to get notes down, especially in barrings. But where you actually want to have the weight coming from is your your shoulder and biceps and triceps and trapezius in your back. Um, that's where you want the weight from. Because you can play entire pieces that need bares without... Let's see if I'm doing a magic trick. I don't know, let's... Uh... You know, you can play bares, it was all bar chords, I think, without any thumb on the back at all. The temptation usually is to squeeze. One of the ones, the pieces I used to suffer greatly in left hand pressure was actually uh, La Catedral, you know, and uh, because my hand got very, very tired, but then I tried to work on it just using the arm weight, so you can actually do this. Actually play that whole passage without the thumb on the back. Oh, you'll always want the thumb. I'm not advocating to, uh, but I'm saying you don't need that. Um, is it a fulcrum? Like you don't need the squeezing power of the hand because I remember this part of my hand got wickedly sore. <laughs> so see if you can shift the responsibility of the weight to the larger muscles because they can handle it. They're stronger, uh, and of course try out the buzzing and see if you can actually get away without doing the barre at all. That's that's the best way, if you could just take it out completely. So thanks everyone, and uh, oh, thanks Lin Tao. Um, thanks for saying thanks. <laughs> thanks everyone for tuning in. This was a complete uh, experiment, and uh, if you'd like me to do more of these, I'm very happy, just let me know in the comments. Uh, I do live sessions with the members of the Classical Guitar Corner about once every two weeks, but they can actually we can actually see each other. So their faces are on the screen, we talk and dialogue, and actually they often play uh, pieces and then I give them feedback and we workshop pieces, so that's how it operates. Um, oh, thanks Sam. <laughs> but uh, it's great to hear from all of you. Many, many, many people, you know, many names here are new to me. Uh, maybe you've been listening to the podcast or on the email list, but it's always nice to have more direct uh, interaction. So uh, I'm happy to, happy to do some more. But thanks everyone, and uh, this was fun. Thanks uh, Michael and Alex and Sam and Kaon and Lim. Uh, I, I will, I will do more, seeing as, uh, seeing, oh, my phone's buzzing, it's probably a Vita. <laughs> All right, everyone, uh, take care, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.